It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. What you're about to hear is the two-minute trailer for a film about to be released in theaters this month, October 2018. The film is called Jane and Emma. It's based on the historical relationship of Jane Manning, one of the few black converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during its infancy, and Emma Smith, who presided over the church's women's organization, the Relief Society, and who was married to the prophet Joseph Smith. I know you can't see the trailer, but it's worth hearing even just to get a taste of the film's incredible soundtrack, Jane and Emma. We come to see the prophet Joseph. They've come all the way from Connecticut. Really? We tried to get on the boat. They wouldn't let us on account of our being black. So, we walked. That must be, what, seven or eight hundred miles? Yes, sir. Jesus, take me to the light. Enslaved. To the light. Beaten. For no reason but the color of skin. The they are not just children of Abraham. Jesus, take me to they are children of God. To the light. We're the chosen. You be careful. It's my duty to protect the saints, no matter the cost. A rumor's been floating through town. There's a price on Joseph. A thousand dollars for his head. It's only the two of us over here. No help. Strangers have dragged Joseph from my house before. It won't happen again. You know how to use it. To that. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I thought marrying Joseph would be like marrying any other church but it was never that simple. I wanted you to be my sister forever. I'm your sister till someone thinks I'm your girl. And if a mob comes for him, do you think you can hold them off? You'd be surprised at the things God gives me strength to do. God himself was once as we are now. That is the great secret. He ain't just your husband. He's the Lord's prophet. I don't know what you want from me! Joseph! But certain folks won't see you the way Joseph saw you. As a sister. My sister. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Hold on to your family. It's an emotional film that delves into some of the most sensitive issues in Latter-day Saint history, including racial tensions, polygamy, and the death of Joseph Smith. In this special episode, we're joined by the director of Jane and Emma, Chantel Squires, as well as Melissa Leilani Larson, who wrote the screenplay. You can send questions or comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And now it's Chantel Squires and Melissa Leilani Larson talking about the film Jane and Emma. We're joined today by Chantel Squires. She's a producer and director of the new film Jane and Emma. Chantel, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you so much for having us today. Yes, and you say us because Melissa Leilani Larson also joins us. She wrote the screenplay for Jane and Emma. Glad to be here. All right, let's begin by talking about the plot a little bit. Give us a little movie trailer. Is it okay if I call you Mel? Sure, that's great. Go ahead. The basic storyline of Jane and Emma is that Jane Manning has moved away from Nauvoo in search of work and comes back unsure of the reason why. And when she returns to Nauvoo, she finds out that Joseph Smith has recently been martyred the night before. And, um, and she decides to stay and spend the night watching over Emma, who's in a fragile state. So this is something that's based on historical figures, but it's a reconstruction. It's, it's an imaginative reconstruction of something that didn't actually happen this night that's depicted in the film. Correct. And how did you decide on that rather than doing like a biopic of, of Jane Manning James, for instance, that kind of shows the, the sweep of her life, which is really dramatic and tragic in and of itself? It is. It is. There are a lot of really interesting things that happened to Jane over the course of her life. But the difficulty with doing a really epic biographical kind of survey of her life is that you're covering a lot of years in a pretty short window. Usually with a film, what you're trying to do is to tell a pretty, the best stories are pretty compact. And so what we wanted to do with this film, because we knew that we were going to be making something pretty low budget and simple. And so we try to confine things to a very specific 
space and time. So we decided to tell this story over the course of a night, over the course of this night after Joseph Smith's martyrdom, and um, and focus on Jane and Emma and their friendship. Because drama is really interesting when you're putting someone a complex character in a situation where they have to make choices, they have to make decisions, and things are volatile, and people and their feelings are vulnerable. And so we wanted to put, it's it's kind of like chemistry, you're trying to to make the perfect story, uh, where everything will just, reactions will just go off at the right times. Hmm. And so we decided to put this story um, on this one night when when emotions were just really, really high and see how these women would react to each other and to what was happening. Yeah, it would be interesting to do like a biopic film of someone like Jane Manning James would be difficult because like you say, you're, you'd have to try to compress it into an hour and a half or maybe right. even two hours. And so exactly. it would basically just be a series of short set pieces like her conversion, traveling to the West, appealing for the ability to be endowed in the temple mm-hmm. and all of that. Yeah, because the difficulty with her history, while it's fascinating it is it is basically in vignettes and and when you're making a film what you need to do is you're creating a narrative you're telling a story you have to find a dramatic through line to go through all of those events and connect them together and it's easier to and easy is potentially not the best word to use (laughs) but it's um it's more effective to to try to just make things as small and compact as possible and so it's like, we're going to look at this one night. And we do, with the film, use flashbacks to tell some of the story of Jane's conversion and the traveling with her family from Connecticut to Nauvoo, things like that, and, and her interactions with Joseph and Emma when Joseph was still alive. And we, we hit on those moments. But really, the best way to get a know, to know a character is to spend time with them in, yeah, in a specific time frame. And so we wanted to keep things just really small and contained. And also, for budgetary purposes, we're like, I write plays. I write plays with two or three characters, and we put them in a room because that's, you know, the lowest budget you can with the play. And that's what we wanted to do with this film is to keep things just really contained and small. Did it take convincing Chantel when, when who, who kind of came up with that conceit and how did the process of locking into it go? Mm-hmm. Well, I think just right from the beginning, we knew going into it that we started out with no money, right? So you're like, okay, what what's the lowest budget that we can do? And knowing, approaching Mel who is a playwright, that was the really one of the first reasons why, because it was like, okay, if we can have a film that's contained Mm. within a structure that's small, then it's affordable. So it really started out with that in mind, that that was really the beginning of it. And I think too, along the way, as we kept it small, it's because, you know, as you're creating a story, it's, you have to ask yourself, okay, while this is interesting, does it move the story forward? And in any film, even when you're, you've shot it, at the end of the day, you're, you have to make that decision. Does this move the story forward or do I need to cut it out? Hmm. And that's what makes a, a better film. So it just, it was always on our mind just because that's how we, we do storytelling. It also makes for good bonus features on the Blu-ray. When you <laughs> can put in, are there going to be deleted scenes, do Ooh, you think? Oh, there's a good one. If, oh, yeah? If that's the case, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If it gets a, re- a release like that. Uh-huh. I'm going to say, too, as I'm watching this, there were moments of the film, even though it's very, it's an imaginative reconstruction. Again, it's this uh, night after Joseph Smith is killed, Emma and Jane are together there sort of dealing with the fallout of that emma being supported by jane there were also moments in the film where i recognized direct quotes from historical sources so talk a little bit about that about actually accessing history and what you did there oh sure well i'm i'm a nerd when it comes to history and i and i love i love biopics and i love historical fiction i love historical narratives Though I will confess to being a little wary when you see, you know, when a film starts based on a true story, I'm like, well, how much of it did they make up? Yeah. And and what's interesting about this story, to think about Jane and those vignettes of her life, these moments that we know about, the hard thing is that when you have a moment, like, you know, Jane and her family walking from Connecticut to Nauvoo, they walked 800 miles, and and I can say that to you in a sentence, but to create that in a film... I have to write dialogue to go with that. We have to think about the shots and the scenes. And there is actually a lot of it that has to be imagined. It's it's really impossible to make a film that is historically accurate in the way that some people, I think, want it to be. Because you have to, you're, that's what you're doing is you're imagining. The goal is not to create a historical document. The goal is to take the historical documents that we have and to make something interesting and entertaining out of it. 
and to help people to have an emotional experience. So for me, I was able to spend a lot of time with Jane's autobiography that she dictated when she was in her 80s and several of her letters, the documents that we have about her. There's a really great interview she did with the Young Women's Journal at the turn of the century. And then also I spent some time with several books about Emma and Joseph and their relationship and their correspondence. There's a really moving letter from Emma to Joseph that I just think is so, it just make, it gives me chills when I just think about it. And so I look for those moments that I can take the historical documents and insert them into the fiction because it does have to be a fiction. We had, that was something I knew going in. It's like, here's a woman that is so amazing and wonderful and we just have to take a guess at what she was like based on what we have. The information we have is just so limited. So we have to take take a guess and hope that people will get to know her better and then of their own volition go and spend some time with historical sources. Right. So when I could quote things, the King Follett sermon. Yeah, but even then the nerds will say, mm, but wait, that <laughs> happened in a grove, not in the 70s hall. Yeah, we didn't have money for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the basic truth of it. It's like, and it seems like it should be cheaper to shoot outside under the trees, but no, it yeah. wasn't. Also because we're shooting in the winter. <laughs> yeah, the season, yeah. sound, lighting. There's uh, a lot of things. You can control all of that when you're indoors. Yeah. You can't control it when you're outdoors. Well, the yeah. nerds will still cry out. The I'm nerds sure. are gonna, There are some things the nerds are going to cry out about, <laughs> but um, being a nerd, I feel good about what we're able to accomplish. Good. Good. So both of you are Latter-day Saints yourselves. You have Latter-day Saint backgrounds. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about what it's like dealing with some of the sensitive topics. You mentioned, Mel, dealing with Joseph and Emma, and this movie doesn't over-sentimentalize their relationship. And um, Chantel, some of the direction, obviously, uh, facial expressions, uh, some of Emma's memories, some of these flashbacks show tension in their marriage. Talk a little bit about what it's like to deal with sensitive topics like that in, in a movie as a Latter-day Saint. Yeah, you know, I think that the experiences that we have in our own personal lives certainly come through our, the art that we make. And I guess I look at my experience as a Latter-day Saint with a lot more objectivity than I used to because of certain things that I've gone through in my life that have kind of shaken my world <laughs> and, and realizing that, okay, I don't have to have a perfect life. In fact, I don't know who who does. And when I realized this, and it took a lot of pain to get there and, and a lot of trials that we go through to understand that life isn't A plus B equals C. And, and so I came into this process believing that it's very important to be real about the hard things because if we can't address the hard things and talk about them as realities and truths, and experiences that have been given to us and in a lot of ways entrusted to us, then how can we really become the people that we are supposed to become? And how can we move forward, even as just a church as a whole, in overcoming some of our behaviors and just the things that kind of hold us back? I really believe it's so important. And so I think that was one of the, the great things about making this film is that, you know, you're kind of creating a space to be able to share those things and I felt like both Jane and Emma gave us the opportunity to do that because certainly Emma wasn't having the time of her life you know we, we caught her in a moment where her husband has just passed away has been murdered so obviously that's maybe the most intense night of her life right so that's that's a heightened point of her life but also then as you're talking about going through the flashbacks and seeing her relationship with Joseph and there was a stress and she was dealing with these real things, the issues that she was having with the sister, sister wives that were there. And I just, I, I guess for me, like as we were, would go through the script over the two years, it was like, we have to put ourselves in her shoes and imagine what that felt like, whether or not that's what it felt like for her. We as Latter-day Saint women, <laughs> we imagined what it would feel like for us. And we also took our own personal experiences and feelings that we've had and infused it into her experience. And I just think it's so, I think it's so important that we can start really just talking about these things as, as a reality and learning how to see the truth as it is for wh whoever's truth you're trying to see, you're trying to see your own truth. Like what does that look like? And, and why, why does it look different than what I thought? And that's okay. And it's okay for Emma to feel those things mm -hmm. 
it is 100% okay. And I wanted to give that to her. I felt like that was really important. And I would say the same for Jane. It didn't feel overdetermined. So, for example, speaking specifically of the way that polygamy comes up, um, Joseph Smith having multiple wives and Emma dealing with that. And it wasn't in the forefront of the plot, but it was there. And you also didn't drive the interpretation of it in a way that would force people who are watching the movie to either condemn Joseph Smith or agree with what he was doing either, which I thought was really interesting. Institutional Mm -hmm. films will usually put a positive sort of faith-promoting gloss on difficult things like that. Like, oh, polygamy was hard, but they were faithful and it was wonderful. You don't do that. And you also don't say Joseph Smith was a scoundrel and a terrible person. This was a horrible thing. It seems like there was some breathing room that you left in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really believe in filmmaking. I mean, there's definitely different ways you can take things. And as a director, that's my job is to direct people. And I just feel like if I can help someone love the human being that they are watching and that would give the audience member a chance to step into that person's shoes because you can step into her shoes and sit there and think whoa how would I feel so you can't really judge how she feels or not because you're giving an open and an honest experience of what that person is going through that's really how I I really try to make all the films that I make it's just very much like you know there can be so many opinions on one side or the other. Things can get so political. And I think a lot of times when you do that, you eliminate a lot of people pretty quickly. And I don't know Emma's truth. <laughs> I don't know Jane's truth. I can't assume to know anyone's truth. So I just have to, as an artist, look at something and interpret it the way I can with as much love for that person as possible and be real and honest, but also allow them to have their own voice in the film. Was I imagining this, or was there like a moment where it showed the Partridge sisters give each other a glance, or was that just uh, just random people in the room? Am I imagining you seem that? You to be very observant. It's very observant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> was that? That's a wise observation. Okay, well, viewers, there you go. Check that out, see if you can catch that. It sounds, Chantel, like this was kind of a really personal project for you, then you talked about bringing your own heart into it in, in the way that the film was put together. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think every film I do ends up getting there because you have to have a personal connection with something if you're going to spend two and a half years of your life doing it. And I just, I really think that as a Latter-day Saint woman, there was so much that I was able to put into this film personally. And even just the experiences that they had and and growing up, I grew up in a, a home, my mother's from Peru, my dad is from Utah. And, you know, I had, I grew up in this home that was biracial. And my experience there, it was not the easiest. You know, I I didn't ever feel like I belonged anywhere. It was such a, it was hard all through elementary and junior high and high school to, to really know where I belonged and who I was and to understand the, the color of my skin, which I don't think compares at all to being an African American. I, I know what it's like to be Peruvian and have that conflict, but it opened my eyes to see how integrating two different cultures can be so hard because that's what I experienced my whole life. I did. And I, I mean, it's only been in the last five years that my mother and I have really come to this place where we really do understand each other. And she's my mother, but she's just so different culturally than everything around me and that's that's played a huge role in in really giving me some empathy and understanding for the difficulty that Jane and Emma have which really still exists today integrating and being one as a people when we don't treat people that are don't have the same skin color as us the same we really don't and it's not it hasn't resolved because it's really so hard. It's just, it's very hard and you have to do a lot of work. You have to do so much work and it's so important. So I would say like that really was a huge thing for me and and kept me going because it was, was, it's hard, it's hard to make a movie, but I would say the topic and the sensitivities of this film and trying to get it right and really 
like trying to tell the most honest and truthful story. It was very, very difficult. And, um, but I knew it was important. I, I think it's so important. What would you say about, you, you mentioned something about, you know, you can kind of know what Jane, some of the things Jane felt like. She was a, a, a black member of the church at a time when there were hardly any black members of the church. Most everybody was white. And you have a Peruvian background, so you kind of felt like you didn't have a home. But you also said there were differences there. I'm interested in what those are, like, and, and how this project maybe informed you. Is it, is it so that, did Black Latter-day Saints consult on the project at all? And Yeah, we actually collaborated with two women who are African-American members of the church who many people may actually be familiar with. They are the sisters in Zion, um, Tamu Smith and Zandra Vrains. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So they were part of the collaboration of this film and I think really helped bring some authenticity to the film itself. Yeah. Also, you know, we had a few other people that we collaborated with as well, but they were working through the story. You know, we would talk about the story. We would talk about Jane. We would talk about, and we would really dig into their experiences. And I think one of the most helpful things for me, it, it took, I don't know how long into it, possibly a year. And I just remember like feeling their pain, not Jane's pain, right? Like this wasn't really about Jane. I was, I was seeing the things that were happening in the church. I was seeing the things that they were experiencing in the church. And as different things would happen, like just in life, I was just watching. Like and, Ferguson happened, for yeah. example. Like there were all these. And Charleston, like. Charleston, Virginia, like these different yeah, cause difficulties we've been doing this in the for United two States. Years. Yeah. And, and, you know, as, as we would be sitting there trying to, to figure out who Jane is, and, you know, they'd say, well, you know, I don't think that this would happen or what. And so we're like, okay, well, why is that? Why? And so we'd really, that's mm. what I'm talking about, the work mm -hmm. that has to be done. We were like, okay, well, then what about this? Let's try this. And then along with that process, seeing what they were experiencing and, and hearing them and listening to them. I just remember like one day just feeling the pain that black Mormons have. And now that's because our film is about Mormons. This is obviously like outside of the scope of religion, obviously, yeah. but that was what I was experiencing and seeing. And, and I knew like, okay, you have to feel that from Jane because it's real. And I, I didn't know. I did not know before this process. And that's why I just feel like it took, and, and it's still hard. Like it's hard to understand. And it's, it's hard to help people understand that you do understand. You know, like we as human beings, we just have this really hard time knowing how to have empathy. It's like the trial of humanity. And, and I think that obviously that's this huge scope and this film cannot solve that. Yeah. But I would say that is something that I have really, um, I've been learning and I've been trying, you know, like <laughs> there's the line in the film, it's like, I'm trying. <laughs> and I just think that's what it has to be. We have to be trying all the time. You know, whether or not it's perfect and every person that watches this, whatever race they are, is going to say, oh, yeah, that's the film. That's it doesn't matter. I feel like there are a lot of truths. I 100 percent believe that. And I know that. And I know that because people have been resonating with the film since yeah. we made it. But it wasn't like the reason why we took two and a half years two two years to make it was because it took that long to get it right because it was that hard. It was interesting because these this this theme of empathy and, and, and of and of racial issues within the church, but which also transcends the church, was there throughout the film, but it was never explicitly foregrounded in any in your face way. And and I think that the screenplay was pretty careful in in not being ham fisted about this, but but letting some of the things just be observed. And there's a scene, for example, where a neighbor comes to visit Emma and asks to borrow Jane. Talk about that scene, Mel. Sure. Um, well, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That's a relief to me. Yeah. <laughs> the screenplay is not ham-fisted. I think that's kind of the goal of what we try to do here is to tell a story, and then and it's got to be about the story instead of the message, and then the audience will take whatever message they need to take from it. And so, with that scene, the goal was to put Jane and Emma both in a situation where where they are both faced with someone else's basically blatant racism mm -hmm. and how do they both deal with it and then deal with each other and and there've been a lot of there were a lot of different iterations of that scene and went a lot of different ways and and the one that we settled on i think 
Oh, spoilers. 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 <laughs> but I feel like it it's really true to the problems that we tried to tell in the film, the relationship between Jane and Emma, this kind of misunderstanding of what it is to be black when you're white. And that is still a problem today, both as Mormons and as Americans, that sometimes it's this matter of, yeah, we need to learn to listen and we need to learn to empathize. And, and in this situation, Emma just doesn't know how to deal. Like, she knows that this neighbor is in the wrong at the same time that she doesn't, you know, necessarily put her in her place. She doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily argue. She doesn't, I mean, she doesn't take that moment to stand up for Jane. Yeah. And Jane feels that. And, and that to us was dramatically the most interesting way to say, hey, this is something that happens all the time. And we we need to be more aware of it and we need to be more we need to be more active we have a tendency i think sometimes when when we see a problem and i think this is <laughs> it makes general statements it's like <laughs> one of the problems we have with with racial tension today is that we have a tendency to separate it if it's not happening to us directly right here right now we're like oh that's really terrible that's really awful it's really sad it's happening in another state on the other side of the country and you you have to be just more aware and more active. We need to be more proactive about how we treat people and hope that that, you know, that there are ripples and that goes out as opposed to just being passive and going, oh, that's too bad. I thought it was interesting, an interesting decision to have Emma be the one to kind of drop the ball. Frankly, you know, this isn't a romanticized picture of Emma, especially in that scene. You don't save her from the kind of mistakes that that she may have made and that a lot of people today still make. Right. I'm, I'm the most interested in showing these historical and kind of iconic figures as human beings. That's more interesting to me. I mean, perfect people make for a boring movie. Yeah. <laughs> and so we wanted both we wanted both Jane and Emma and to an extent Joseph to deal with things and to be real about it. I mean, that's what we go to the movies to see and to experience is to see people to find something that we as an audience can relate to. And and in that situation, you're hoping that the audience will watch a scene like that and decide that they would act differently. Hmm. And there's other moments too. I'm thinking, for example, there was a moment where a lot of people in the audience, we had a sneak preview here through the Maxwell Institute. A lot of people in the audience audibly gasped at this one moment when there's an overt racial slur used really early in the film. Talk about the decision that went into that because there are conversations about whether people should represent that, should use that kind of a term and, and who gets to use it? Well, the, the difficulty there is that we really wanted to have a moment, to have a scene where we just demonstrated what it was like to be black in America in 1844. And in and, some cases today. And in some places today. I mean, that's the crazy thing about looking yeah. at this as a period piece is how relevant and timely yeah. it is mm -hmm. um, to say we're what, 150 years out? That's probably bad math. And we still have these problems. And so that scene also went through a lot of iterations. There was a lot of discussion about it. It's really hard. It's a hard moment emotionally, and it's a hard moment to watch because it's, it is uncomfortable, but I kind of think that's the point. We can't take that moment out of the movie and allow the audience to be comfortable when that's a discomfort that Jane lived with. And she couldn't, you know, she couldn't turn it off. She couldn't cut it out. And black Americans today can't turn it off and cut, they can't cut it out like it's I mean the nice thing about a movie is you can edit out the things you don't like okay great life is not that way and so it was a it was a hard scene it's a tricky scene but we felt it was important to have it for that reason yeah I mean it did it did have a lot of iterations <laughs> it was it was harder actually earlier on and it was so important to st even just to start out that way because like Mel said it's it is her life and the allowing people to have empathy for someone you just can't do that if you don't get to feel how hard that is or see how hard that is or just even for a moment get uncomfortable so it was just essential that it was in how about the actor how about directing that scene because the actor has to go in there and and say the n-word while also being uh, abusive uh, physically aggressive with her was that hard to shoot? What's the actor's process look like? Yeah, actually, it was. I wasn't sure how how it was gonna gonna work. I hadn't shot a scene like that yet in this film, and so he was very focused. He separated himself from us all the way up until that the scene was being shot. We traveled together and everything. He just he kept very distant so that he could do what he needed to do and not 
see this as we're making a movie. It just like he needed to be in character. You know, I respected that completely because it's a very intense scene. And, and we worked through a lot of different variations on it. And I mean, you know, Jane also, Danielle Deadweiler, who played Jane, she's able to carry so much in this film. She's phenomenal. And so to see... Was that scene hard for her too? I mean, that's, I think, maybe the most frightening scene for her. Yeah, I think I think it was. I don't know that anything was hard for her. She's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but she definitely, the, the intensity of the scene and the different things that I had them do, and, you know, we tried it different ways. Mm -hmm. I was very sensitive to it, but she was just... No, the, she said, this is so important. She believed in the importance of it. So she was like, no, no, don't be, you know, don't feel bad. Like this has to happen. We have to make this scene as good as it can possibly be because it means so much to the story. <laughs> so, so both of the actors were really great to work with. That's Chantelle Squires. She's a producer and director of the new film Jane and Emma. It's going to be released in theaters on October 12th, 2018. Is that theaters in Utah and then hopefully moving out or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that okay. will be the... Okay, so it, on our website, it shows exactly which theaters. Okay, so yeah, check out the website. Is it Jane and Emma Movie. Dot com. So check out Jane and Emma movie dot com. The movie's releasing on October 12th. We're also speaking with Melissa Leilani Larson. She's written the screenplay for Jane and Emma. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Emma uh, again here and some of the there's old stereotypes that Latter-day Saints used to reckon with when it came to Emma. She stayed in Nauvoo after most of the church members moved to the West, for example. There were questions about her reliability or sanity. She later on would deny that Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage, for example. She didn't stay with the main body of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you're depicting her in this film it's not a hero film for Emma. It's not a villain film for Emma. She's, she's just there. Talk about Emma as a figure in this film and sort of navigating some of these stereotypes that people might have about her, whether romanticized or villainized. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's very interesting because I feel like this night in her actual history, in her actual life, had to have been a turning point for her. And that was really a conversation that we'd had a lot where, you know, before this, I mean, she's, to me, she's an incredible woman. I love her so much and I, I respect her and I understand her. And I know that the only person that truly understands Emma is God. <laughs> and so we, as we were trying to, you know, work on the story, it was like, okay, well, let's, let's put ourselves in her shoes because how many of us do that? I mean, really how many books have put them in her shoes how many films like there's just not a lot where we really give her that space and i think that to have all of these things that have happened i mean not only that but yes she was pregnant during this time right like so you think about what that's like for all the hard times she's pregnant in all the hard times in her life and she has all of these things just kind of compile and she's in this intense time in her relationship with Joseph because of the other wives that we, we haven't really addressed those issues either and and so I think just really getting into her headspace and allowing this to kind of I don't know for me I just look at it as a little bit of a deliverance for her <laughs> because it sometimes we need that <laughs> and I I just I feel like this film gives her that space and and you know people can take what they want from it but I really wanted to be able to give her that. Does that resonate with you, Mel, as the screenwriter and kind of what you did with Emma? Yes, I think I, I agree with what you said about the stereotypes. And also, I feel that, you know, usually when we think about Emma, you know, in a Sunday school context, we tend to think about her just as an extension as Joseph. Like she's like, you know, Joseph's <laughs> Joseph's number one fan. And there were she was um, so dedicated to him and to their family for, you know, the entirety of their marriage and, and his life. But we seldom try to think about her outside of that. We, I think, just sometimes are always looking at her as part of him. And we don't, we need to really look at Emma as her own person because I think she deserves that. I mean, that's what we all deserve. And so it was really important to me to look at her. I wanted to just create as complete a character as I could and to think about her outside of Joseph, but also in tandem with Joseph. 
I was insistent from the beginning that, yeah, that polygamy be mentioned because I, I didn't think it would be fair to do a dramatization of her and not at least mention it and have it going on. And also because it's in Jane's history, the, the Partridge sisters and the Lawrence sisters are both mentioned in Jane's autobiography as living in the house at the same time. Because it's true, we don't, it's something that we just up until this point haven't talked about. And we need to look at Emma and her life what she went through there's a line um where she says strangers have dragged joseph from my home before and i think about yeah what she had to watch and what she was witness to and what she had to deal with on so many different occasions basically the fallout of what he was doing his calling and she was just always working so hard to support him and their relationship is so deep and so real and yet sometimes I just don't think we, as members of the church, give her a fair shake. Like if we if we look on Joseph with a bit of hero worship, it kind of bleeds over into her, but not really. And I think we, we owe it to her to at least spend some time and better understand what her life was like. So we hope to do that a little with the film. I think um, few things are as divisive amongst Latter-day Saint filmgoers as depictions and portrayals of Joseph Smith, finding the right actor, putting the right words in his mouth, and all of that. So it almost seems impossible if you're trying to please everybody. So talk about Joseph Smith as portrayed and as written. Well, I'll start with who we cast. That was really hard because we had a casting call and Brad Schmidt, who plays Joseph Smith, was phenomenal. I really loved his audition, but there was always this question, does he look like Joseph Smith? Yeah. You know, and, and I'm just like, okay, I got to get that out of my head because I don't know. I mean, of course, we have images and things. And I had such a connection to his his audition. And when I would, you know, did a callback with him and interacted, there was just such a connection there that I was like, this is Joseph Smith. We can't find someone that is exactly the same. But I, oddly enough, he is 38 years old. He was the same height. I felt like he had the same build when we really got into it. I thought, wow, this is... You know, he's strikingly similar, actually, to Joseph Smith. And so I just had to trust that, you know, my connection to him and what we had done with this role was going to just be the thing that seals the deal for everyone else. And, I mean, he did he did a remarkable job. I felt like we... How long did he have to lie on a table, <laughs> by the way? Because his, his dead body is in the film for... Quite a bit of it. Yeah, he actually lets him a lot of the time. Yeah. If you don't see his face, then maybe it might not be him. <laughs> uh, but he, no, he was very willing <laughs> to do it. You know, he was just, he was all in. And that was the coolest thing, talking to him about doing this project. He had other projects that he pushed aside to do this because when he read the script, he just felt so compelled to do this this film. And to see, I think there's maybe like four or five real solid scenes of him. And so when we would talk about them, they're all portraying something very unique about Joseph's personality. And that's what we really wanted to do was just give, we, we can only give a glimpse. The film's called Jane and Emma. Yeah, Because exactly. they're in most of the film, but he's such a vital part of the story. And so every scene that we have in there of Joseph is very deliberate. So when I was talking through those scenes with him and giving him things to, to read and study before he came on, on set. Like he just, I mean, really took everything to heart and was like, Oh, this is a real human. <laughs> and this is so intense. You know, every single thing, like he just, he was able to really to capture Joseph Smith. And also I would say while we were on set, he was probably the actor that I was able to, have the most uh, molding with in in some of those scenes because I'm not Joseph Smith I don't know but I am a member of the church and I've had experiences that I could bring to the table so we would do a take and I'm we would just start talking on like a very deep level and we would understand the scene in a different way and the cool thing was we were on set and he was like wow there's just so much subtext in this script and i was like yes <laughs> yeah there's a lot <laughs> yay so but he and he was able to just see the subtext sometimes for the first time he was like wow i didn't i didn't know what he was talking about until i'm sitting here looking at jane hearing the words that are coming out of his mouth and he he got emotional because all of a sudden 
it felt real bringing who he was, what he was trying to do um, for Jane and for the church and all the things that were going on in his life, you know, and I'm, I would say like, Hey, just remember right now, like people want to kill you (laughs) for what you believe. So to have someone like Jane come in, think of what that must feel like to know that she believes, right? And, and just to see him just take that and own it and bring it to the, the screen, it was really, really great. Yeah, and talk about writing Joseph, because there are moments when he, he seems really very confident, to use a, a kind word. There are scenes where he loses his temper, other scenes where he's more emotional. So talk about writing for someone like Joseph Smith, this prominent figure. Sure. Uh, it's really, well, it's really easy to be intimidated. But I think the nice thing about this story, about about Jane being the focal point, is that while, unfortunately, Jane is lesser known to, uh, to a lot of members of the church, and hopefully this film is going to help to change that, because she is lesser known, um, using her as the POV to get to know both Joseph and Emma has actually worked out really, really well for me dramatically, because if you just write a film wherein Joseph is the protagonist, it's just really, really hard, as you were saying earlier, to please everybody. It's just, it's, no, it's not hard. It's impossible. (laughs) There are a lot of people, you know, certain, they have an image of him in their head. I think most Latter-day Saints have a thought of what Joseph was like. And so you're always going to have somebody who comes and says, oh, that's not like the Joseph in my head. And, And the nice thing about this film being focused on Jane is that I'm able to, I hope, take a little bit of what Jane said about Joseph as the starting place for what Joseph is like in the film. And then also for me to just to take a chance and, and to take a guess at what he was like. But because he's not the focus, because he's a little bit in the background, um, and we're seeing him through Jane's filter, I felt a little bit more of a freedom to try things with him. And, and I didn't feel quite as intimidated by the history I felt a little more free to allow the drama and the character to come to the forefront as opposed to the historical expectation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think it does. Uh, I would love to add something to this discussion about Joseph along with Emma and the actress that played Emma. I felt like she and Jane, uh, they all were able to look at their character as a character because they, they didn't bring a lifetime of Mormonism into this. None of them were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So they looked at the script. They read all the research that I sent them and brought the character to life in a way that I think is so unique because of what we wrote in the script and what, uh, what Mel wrote in the script and what we had, what we wanted to bring out in these characters. They saw that. And I remember having a conversation with Emily, who played Emma, and we were talking about, okay, you know, how, how should we how should we say this and how should we do that? And she goes, well, I mean, she just, she had lost all these children. She just kind of goes off on all of the things that Emma had gone through. And she was kind of like fighting for <laughs> Emma, you know? And I just looked at her, I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that because I understood where she was coming from in her decision. And, and so she was really, I think, kept the integrity of, of Emma's character. And the same thing with Jane. There was, I, I just, I don't know that I could have asked for a better cast who cared more about the character of these people, the integrity of these people, and who brought more to the table. And, and I think that's what makes them so real and why you can watch Jane up there, you know, praying to God and just feel it with your whole soul because she just she became Jane and it was phenomenal with all the emotions that go into filmmaking too there's also just some logistical things about making a film like this so I wanted to talk about that a little bit there's a photo Chantel on your website where you're in a little cabin where the movie's being shot you're with Mm -hmm. Jane Manning and Isaac James and you're bundled up you've got this big puffy coat on and hat and then they're just wearing their regular (laughs) sort of (laughs) Costumes. We did not pay them enough that night. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, talk about that. <laughs> well, I I think yeah, when you are making such a low budget film and you have fifteen days to make this movie and it's just intense, like you pray that everything goes well. And I would say that it did. I really believe that we were blessed that all the things that needed to happen <laughs> happened. This one night, for some reason, the temperature dropped like twenty degrees. And it was already, it was March, so it was already cold, 
But we go out and we were planning on shooting out in this woodshed that, you know, didn't have like really solid walls. And then all of a sudden it just drops and it starts the, like there was a little snow that started falling and my heart <laughs> broke. My heart broke in half. I was so sad because I'm like, oh my gosh, there's four pages that we have to shoot tonight. And it's Isaac and Jane. This is so important. And the actors were freezing. We had to turn on the heater, the propane heater that made this really loud noise. noise so, of yeah. course, when we start shooting, we had to turn it off so yeah. we could get good audio. So we brought ice chips, and they put ice chips in their mouth, and they had, like, these water bo- – like, these Would that prevent water. them from breathing well, air? Or, like, what would the, the first, ice chips do? For the first few lines that they would say, their breath would match the air. So you wouldn't see the breath. Right, but there's a little uh, visual effects that we did end up having to do at the end of the day. <laughs> but you know, so we would okay, hurry, take out the ice chips. Okay, turn off the heater. Now go. Now and why no breath? If it, did you? Oh, because I guess the it was film supposed, takes place it was in the supposed summer. to be the summertime. That's right. <laughs> so oh, <laughs> and we never ran into an issue until that night, and it <laughs> was yeah. So that was a really sad night for me. But it was a cold June that year. Yes. It was. <laughs> the great news is that the actors did amazing. So we got what we needed. And so that we, so when you watch the film, I don't think anyone would have any idea nope. that that scene broke my heart. There were other moments in it that couldn't make it because of what happened. So could have, would have, should have, whatever. But I think it works. The scene does work really well. And they are, they're just they have amazing chemistry and they do really well together so they saved it <laughs> you come at it differently because like you were there for the editing of it do you do you notice like when you're looking at that scene are you like oh man they're freezing right now or, or do you get to lose yourself a little bit in the in the oh i notice everything yeah. <laughs> that my producers are like Chantel, no more visual effects shots yeah. <laughs> but i'm like please please there's like a little breath there and people are like i can't see it but i'm like i can see it take yeah. it out <laughs> yep so it's, they're gone. What other kind of obstacles? Are there any other interesting obstacles that people that don't make films might not think about in terms of making a movie like this? Um, yeah, we had we had a lot of obstacles, but um, it was really amazing. We had such a great crew, like the best of the best. People were really invested in this story, and so we were ended up getting just the the best people to work on the film. So. That was a huge gift for this film because shooting a film in 15, we had one day in Nauvoo, so 16 days total, it was really intense. And everything had to go as planned, like I said. And there was, I, the day that we were shooting in Nauvoo, the forecast said 100% chance of rain. And Nauvoo rain is not like Utah rain. And people were like, what are we going to do? Okay, we got to have a backup plan. And we had an entire day of outside shooting that had to happen in this one day. And I was like, it's not going to rain. And they're like, okay, yeah, yeah. But if it rains, like, what's the backup? But when it does rain, what should we do? I was like, guys, (laughs) it's not going to rain. I'm telling you, this is not going to happen. And (laughs) we got out there on a Monday. It was pouring rain when we arrived. I had to buy boots because my shoes were soaked just getting out of the car. It was just crazy. And people were like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this happen? I'm like, guys, it is not going to be raining tomorrow. We woke up the next day. It was not raining. And I had had kind of anticipated, okay, it's not going to be raining. And the sun's going to be out <laughs> because we really need the sun to be out. The sun didn't come out, but it didn't rain the whole day. It was overcast, which was perfect for lighting purposes. And like it was cold, but everybody was there. You know, we had heaters in the car and like we were able to get everything hmm. that we needed. And then the next morning I went out with my cinematographer, Wes Johnson, and we just went to shoot some B-roll. And as soon as we finished, well, actually, while we we're out there, the sun came out for a minute I'm like oh, get the sun get the sun and then it goes away he rolls out on on the camera roll and starts putting the camera away and it just starts to rain and I was like <laughs> okay we have had a lot of help with this film and I I'm just really overwhelmed there's just so many other little stories like that but That's Chantel Squires she's producer and director of the new film Jane and Emma uh, Mel I wanted to talk to you a little bit about writing this because you were also have been working on the church's new institutional history called Saints. It's a multi-volume history. So I was interested to hear you put that experience alongside this one. For one, you're writing a more straightforward history. For another, you're doing an imaginative reconstruction that's just fiction. Um, The great thing about working on Saints was that um, I was able to work with some really fabulous historians who just know so much about Joseph Smith and his life. And, And the part of the book that I worked on 
was Joseph as a young man, Joseph as a boy. Was the bone surgery in there? The bone surgery, yes. Okay. Yes. The bone surgery and, and Sorry, go ahead. volcano, the tambora. And it was really great to the, the project, the way that it was pitched to me, was that we're looking to make history, I guess for lack of a better word, palatable to people who aren't historians. So we're trying to make things interesting so that, you know, teenagers in seminary are going to pick up this book and not put it down. Yeah, it's like a book people want to read. It's a book that people want to read. And so the goal was to make, um, was to take history that was as accurate and sound as possible, but to make it narratively interesting. So it reads like a narrative, but none of it is fiction. And so I was actually working on that at the same time. That's my day job when I come <laughs> home and work on Jane and Emma, which is kind of in an interesting way, the flip, mm -hmm. which is where I have, okay, I have a historical source that says Jane and her family came into this room with Joseph and Emma and, and Joseph's friend, Dr. Bernheisel and four of Joseph's wives. And Joseph says, tell me the story of how you came here. How, tell me about your travels here. And that's from Jane's autobiography. And we actually have several snippets of dialogue in that scene that are from Jane's record, which is awesome that we have that. But then also I have room to play with it to make it dramatic. And then Chantel and Wes in the shooting of it play around with how it's going to look visually. So it's interesting that in the one with Saints, I'm trying to craft the experience. So the experience feels like fiction. And with the film, we're taking fiction and trying to make it feel like history. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a dual life <laughs> doing both at the same time. What would you say to historians that come to this film? S some of them are going to have some particular expectations. I'm interested to hear you've worked with historians on saints and you've also done this film. So I'm hoping that historians, and I speak as a, as an amateur historian, I hope that people will come with an open mind and understand that we're, what we are presenting here is not a history, that it's an interpretation. I think about Joseph and how there are, you know, there are controversies about supposed photographs of him. We have so many paintings of him and they're all kind of different. There are things and then we have the actual description uh, that people have of him. And so, you know, we're kind of left to our own devices about what we think Joseph looked like. And I feel like when we're making a film like this, I've often said that it, it's kind of like painting a painting where we are taking a guess. I'm saying that this is what Nauvoo looked like at this time. This is what Joseph was like. This is what Emma was like. This is what Jane was like in the story that I am trying to tell. And I'm hoping that historians and just audience members are going to come to this and say, oh, that's just a really interesting interpretation because that's that's what it is and and that's all that it can be and it probably won't i guess if someone wanted to you know go through and say this is inaccurate this is inaccurate <laughs> this is inaccurate then i'm like well i guess you weren't entertained so yeah you're kind of missing the point you're kind of missing the point it's it's cuz for me when i see a film like this i and there is something historical that i go oh that's a real thing. Oh, Joseph actually said that. Yeah, there oh, were that's from Jane's letter. Yeah, I was like, I, I get excited that about those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so so there are Easter eggs. There are moments that I think for people who know the history, they'll get it. But I also hope that people just understand we're trying to make, my goal as an artist is to make something that is emotionally resonant. And that's basically, it's beautiful. That's what I want to do. And so I'm hoping that people will just appreciate it on that level. How did the relationship work out between you two, Chantel, you and Mel working together? How did that come about? And, and how does that work between a director and a screenplay writer? Yeah, Mel and I have a really great collaborative relationship. We have the same sensibility, I guess I would say, in, in, so. in terms of our our approach to storytelling. And that's a tricky thing because you notice there's a lot of different films and they're told a lot of different ways. And when you find someone that you connect with that way and you speak the same visual language, I just think it's just so great to be able to have that. The, the things that you can create when it, you're in tune like that and in sync like that, it, it's just be much better than if you're trying to get the other person to see your vision or, you know, like we just from the beginning, we really connected that way. And, and I think both bringing all of our experience to the table as well, we just, yeah, we, we ended up working really well together. And I think that that 
was such a great process for me as a director because there are a lot of writer directors, you know, that are able to like really if if there's something that's not working in the script, they they go change it, you know. And I'm an editor. Sometimes they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an editor, so I look at things from an editor's perspective, and so I see something. And I remember having a conversation one time where I was like, okay, Mel, I'm telling you right now, this is going to end up on the cutting room floor. So I don't want the whole idea to end there. So let's rework this. And she's like, oh, I see what you're saying. I understand the words that you're trying to say. <laughs> and they will filter through me and come out beautifully on the paper. And that happened so many times. Is there any particular scene that, that, that happened to? I'm interested in like, can you think of a particular example? So when people go watch the film, oh, they'll be like, oh, I that. wish we had written them all down. We should have written them down because it did happen several times. Because that was, I think, probably the the best thing about our working relationship is that when we, there were things that like, I could understand what she was saying, but sometimes it took me a minute to get there. And I think sometimes, you know, artists have strong personalities and sometimes, you know, someone will just say, oh, you're wrong and we're not doing it that way. And your, and your response is to kind of like brace <laughs> up and, and, you know, kind of pout, but we figured out how to talk to each other in a way that we found a way to communicate what needed to be communicated. Yeah. And so it was really great because as an editor, which she, she has a really strong sense of story, which makes a difference. You know, sometimes a director will say, oh, this just doesn't make sense. And really that in my head translates to, oh, I don't really like this. When she had an issue with the story, I knew it's because she has a sense of story. And I'm like thinking in my head, okay, how can I fix it to be what it needs to be? So we did get to a place where we were, we had kind of a working language between us and, and it made, it made all the difference because we all, we were both trying to tell the story the best we possibly could. And I'm trying to think of a specific moment. I don't know, but I think Mel knows more personal anecdotes of my life <laughs> than anyone on this earth. <laughs> well, there were several times when we would be working late at night at her house. And like, there was this time when we would talk about the structure because, you know, we have, we have the course of the night, Jane and Emma going through this night in 1844, and then we'd intersperse it with flashbacks. And we tried, you know, to set all the flashbacks during the day to have a contrast. And we had all of the scenes on cards out on the coffee table. And her dog, who's just no. a puppy, comes in and he just like, he's a big puppy. He just puts his snout on the table and just sniffles <laughs> through everything. And the cards go everywhere. And I mean, the experiences I've had with animals at her house during this film, it's actually amazing we have a script because the guinea pig tried to eat the script. Um, but when they got mixed up, we we're like, well, maybe we were supposed to maybe change. Maybe that's yes, what's supposed to happen. It worked out that way. So yeah, we've had a lot of meetings and spent a lot of time because I don't know that we knew each other super well going into this process, but the last two years have been very, we have established a really great working relationship now. And I'm how like, long, okay, what's next? How long did that screenplay take to, to write? Was it complete before shooting started? Yeah. Yes. I asked that because like, <laughs> well, like with Jaws, I, I didn't know this with Jaws, they, they basically wrote that on the water. Like no, we they were... went out there and shot it while they were writing it. Yeah. That's um, this process. What we tried to do was have the script. We wanted the script to be as solid as possible before going into shooting. And then there were some adjustments. And then there were also a lot of, I mean, there are just a lot of people that are invested in the story. So there are a lot of approvals. Hmm. And, uh, and that's the thing for me, if we're thinking about obstacles, I think about when I write a play, I'm the final say. Yeah, that's it. And that's it. And, you know, directors aren't supposed to change lines. Yeah. <laughs> that's not what you do. And in this situation, it's much more collaborative because also with the play, when it's written, you know, different directors will direct at different ways yep. at different places. And this is getting made the one time. And so there are a lot of people with a lot of say. And my job, a lot of my job was to kind of take all of the feedback from so many people and balance it with what I've been trying to do artistically. So it's like, I need to take all of this and there's a lot, there are a lot of voices mm -hmm. <laughs> and to just kind of make the story as cohesive and solid as possible. And, um, and sometimes the really great thing about us working together was that we were both trying to sort out that together. Mm hmm. Um, and just kind of be like, okay, this is the story that we're trying to tell. And we, and I think one of the strengths of the movie is that we were always on the same page about that. Mm -hmm. So how long before shooting did you write, do you think? I was basically writing constantly since we started writing, which was 
mm-hmm. April of 2016. And then some writing so, happened during the shooting just as you kind of adjusted some things. Yeah, well, when you're making a film, there's three stages of writing. You write the script, and then you shoot the script, and then you edit it. So it and gets writing can happen in that third stage. Oh, there's a lot of... Yeah. Right. And that's what I knew going into it as an editor. I'm like, well... That's why I said, I'm going to cut this out. So say if you want it saved, we got to rewrite it. And because on set, you know, an actor will say a line and it's like, that didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, like maybe this works better. And so, mm. you know, sometimes directors, actors will just take it and just do it. Yeah. But there were some times where, I, I mean, I would call her. I'm on set. People are like, who are you on the phone with? I was like, leave me alone. <laughs> 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 I need to make sure that I don't lose the authentic voice of this film and that was one thing that i really fought to keep because there are there were a lot of voices they were great right and that's the point like we needed to do the work with all the right people and at the end of the day the voice needs to be very solid on the page and i really carved a space there for mel to do that because i even know i'm like oh i'm on set and there's two minutes and i got to make a decision and i rewrite this line I might cut it out because it's not going to sound like Emma. And I haven't been the one that's been caring for what Emma sounds like. Yeah, Even in the words that she would use or the way she would say it even. Exactly. Even if you knew what point you wanted her to make, you you wouldn't necessarily channel the voice that the screenwriter has got. Exactly. So that's what – so we still worked closely on set. Um, did you get to go to the set at all? or I did a little. I mean, the hard thing about the day job was that they were shooting days. <laughs> ah, yes. So I did get to go sometimes. It's fun. It's fun to see it happen and to see it come to life and to sometimes be there and like, oh, we're cutting that. Okay. I'm not going to cry about it. But that was the nice thing is I think there was a lot of trust and I knew because usually when you give something to a director, you hope that they're going to, yeah, you hope that they're going to interpret it right, that they're going to get something along the lines of what you intended. (laughs) And sometimes that's a gamble and you don't know until you see the finished product what it's going to look like. But because we were communicating and yeah, my phone would ring and I'm like, oh, okay, something's going on on set. And we would change things that way. It was nice to be involved and to not be cut out of the process. And even in post, (laughs) when she was editing, like to see things and, you know, to to be a part of making decisions at that level as far as story goes was really great. (laughs) Because yeah, it's true, you are... The script isn't finished until the film's finished. But, and there's the essence of the scene. So it's like, okay, if I lose this, do I lose the essence of the scene? You know, were there too many words to begin with? Is that why it's not feeling right? I mean, that's really, that's why I love editing, because I just feel like you, you do get to have that final, like, you know, the, the actor's going to bring something. And I think Jane in this film, she just brings so many crazy things to this movie that when I'd I'd put in just a look or something, I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's enough, you know, or, you know, things that we didn't know were going to happen. Just even in the relationship between Jane and Emma, it was, you just have to be prepared when you're making a movie that it's going to change. Yeah, it's such an intricate process. That's Chantel Squire. She's producer and director of Jane and Emma. It's a historical drama releasing in theaters October 12th. And among other things, Chantel's also produced and directed Reserve to Fight. Uh, it's a feature-length documentary that aired nationally on PBS. And she won an Emmy for her work on the third season of The Generations Project for BYU TV. We're also talking with Melissa Leilani Larson, who wrote the screenplay for Jane and Emma. And she's also written a bunch of other plays like Little Happy Secrets and Pilot Program. And she wrote the screenplay for Freetown, a film that won the Ghana Movie Award for Best Screenplay and the Utah Film Award for Best Picture. So before we go, I, I want to remind people the movie comes out on October 12th, which is just a few days after this episode will come out. And if you're coming to the episode later on, uh, hopefully it's still in, in a place where you can see it. And if you're not in Utah, hopefully it comes to a place where you can see it. And with that in mind, Chantel, I wanted to ask you about audience. This is a movie that's about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What kind of audiences did you have in mind in making the film? Yeah, I, you know, as we were working on this story, the story was such a important thing for us you know we really as filmmakers like we that was what we prioritized because when we go to the the theaters we want to be entertained we want to be on the edge of our seats we want to feel something that's why i go to the theater is to feel whatever it is i need to feel i will turn something on and that was the most important thing for us as we were working on this film now that doesn't mean it's the only important thing of this movie and i would say the really brilliant thing about our religion is that it's so complex. It's so beautiful in and of itself. There's so much, it's like a tapestry of 
uh, that we can put a story in front of and it just makes it more colorful and makes it more intriguing and interesting. And I've always found when I'm just being really honest about either the, the story or just my life to people that aren't members of the church, they're fascinated by it. I think, I think it's fascinating. And I, and I feel really strongly that we need to be telling stories within the, the historic idea of the Mormon church because there's, there's so much to tell there. But at the same time, that's the backdrop and the story is much bigger than that. And I think it resonates with audiences on a much broader level. And so, you know, I hope that it does reach out to a wider audience. I hope it does really well in Utah. That's it's really important that people go see it so that it can reach out into other other theaters across the country and and hit those those larger audiences because the story and that's one thing I think we've learned along the way that while story was such a focus for us because we wanted to make a really good movie, the topic and the issues that are addressed in this and that these actors bring to life and the script brings to life and everything brings to life are so important and I think are have the ability to resonate with a much larger audience. Yeah, I will say personally speaking, having seen the film that I did, I did feel like it was a human story playing out in a Mormon context and not a Mormon story uh, trying to enter into a human context. Mel, did you have anything else to add? That's the goal, I think, I mean, for, for me as a writer. I mean, because it's about drama is about humanity. It's about human experience. Um, when we find something to relate to, what we're doing is looking for something universal. And usually with the story, you try to do something that's really, really specific. And from that specificity, you know, people can can relate to the characters on a universal level. And so this is, I mean, the story is very specific. We're looking at one woman and the potential of this one night and what might have happened and how she interacts with this other woman that we know historically that they had a relationship, but we're trying to like put them under the microscope of this one night. And my hope is that while these women are are Mormons where they shared, while they shared this faith, they also shared a lot more. They shared a sisterhood and they shared a friendship and there was a lot to them. They're much more complicated than just the faith that they practiced. And faith is something that we all, for those of us who who believe in it and who who have it, it's something that kind of you know enters in. It kind of infiltrates other things in your life and, and helps you to make decisions and how you interact with people. And um, and so my hope with this story is that in just portraying faith as honestly as possible, that someone is going to see something there that just makes them gives them a little more understanding. And it might maybe not in a faith context or in some other aspect in their life where they just see how Jane was able to use faith to endure some pretty incredible things. And if they just take that and, and think about, you know, whatever's going on in their own lives, that's always the hope with me is that someone is just going to see something in the story and, and whatever it triggers in their head emotionally, as long as there is an emotional response, that's what we're going for. <laughs> That's Melissa Leilani Larson. She wrote the screenplay for Jane and Emma. And we also met today with Chantel Squires, the producer and director of the new film. Again, you can see that in theaters in Utah starting October 12th. And you can find out where it's playing at janeandemmamovie.com. Thank you both for being on here. Mel, thanks for coming in. Sure. Glad to be here. And Chantel, it was great having you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this special episode about Jane and Emma. You know, usually you have to wait a whole month between my interviews, but not this time. I've got another interview coming up for you next week, this time with Max Mueller, author of the book Race and the Making of the Mormon People. So stay tuned for that. And by way of announcement, I want to let you know about the Maxwell Institute's conference about race, priesthood, and the temple coming up at Brigham Young University on October 12th. The conference is called 40 Years, commemorating the 1978 priesthood and temple revelation. You can learn more about it at mi.byu.edu slash 40 years. That's four zero years. 